Okay, th thanks again, Anna. Can you hear me today? Ah, yes. Sounds good. Okay. So as, as Anna said, the, in the first four lectures, I explained the 316 project where I studied chapter 3, verse 16 of every book in the Bible, uh, sort of a day in the life of the Bible. And today, um, and, and the verses are here on these posters. Today I'm going to try to summarize the main lessons that I learned from that experience. And um, next week, then in the final lecture, I'm going to talk about new stuff. Uh, I want to try out some ideas that have been floating around in my head about possible relationships between God and computer science. A few years ago, my wife and I were in Sweden at the beginning of December, and we were introduced to a fine piece of music called, if I, my pronunciation is very good, something like Fürkled Good, good, a work by Lars Erik Larsen, uh, written for chorus and a small orchestra. A narrator also uh, reads a poem by Yalmar Goldberg. Uh, the, the word for Kled has something to do with putting clothes on, and the title for Kled Gud means God in disguise. Uh, if I were at home in California now, I would play the CD from, the, from this uh, uh, little su suite, uh, as I always do it uh, this time of year. And uh, actually, I would probably cry a little bit, um, partly in memory of the good times we had in Sweden, and partly in memory of our friend who took us to the concert and gave us the CD because she died earlier this year. But mostly, I guess, um, I, I think I'd cry as I usually do when I hear the narrators touching words about God sometimes inhabiting the earth. If you ever have a chance to, uh, 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 to hear this piece, uh, I, I can recommend it to you. Anyway, my title today is Glimpses of God. We learn about God partly by studying the world, and partly by studying books like the Bible, uh, which tells us about the relations between people and God. My 316 project was an attempt to learn more about the Bible. And so what did I find out? Overall, I found somewhat to my surprise that the Bible verses I studied closely were constantly, consistently interesting and full of stimulation, even for a supposedly educated person like myself. Either God contrived to put unusually excellent material into verse 16 of nearly every chapter 3, or else the Bible is extraordinarily rich. I was bowled over by the number of unfamiliar verses that turned out to be really inspiring. Now, besides learning about the Bible, I also learned a lot about books about the Bible. And I learned a fair amount about theology, the academic subject, the theology being intellectual reflection about religion. When I studied the 316s, I had the chance to use the libraries at many great institutions, for example, um, and over Harvard while I was living in Boston. And then as, uh, after, at the end of the year, as we drove across country on our way back to California, I spent three days at Yale Divinity School and another day at uh, Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, another day in Pittsburgh, and so on, eventually getting back home and uh, spending many days at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that struck me immediately when I compared these places to computer science departments was that theologians really know how to live, a lot better than computer scientists do. Uh, their offices have a much nicer ambiance and uh, uh, for example, I think Yale Divinity School is like heaven on earth. Um, now, now, maybe the new status center at MIT uh, is going to reverse this trend and give computer scientists some great office space. Um, who knows? But at the moment, the theologians are, are definitely way ahead. Um, now, more seriously, the, the 316 project gave me a chance to crack open thousands of books that I would never otherwise have had the uh, motivation to look at. Uh, in this way, I could read parts of the works <clears throat> of theologians from many different centuries and from many different religious persuasions, because the indexes to those books would tell me where they had commented on one of the 316 verses that I was researching. The random sampling methodology that I used could naturally be expected to give reasonable insights into quantitative things involving numerical statistics. For example, the 59 verses I looked at contained a total of 1,567 words in the King James Version of the Bible. That's about 26.6 words per verse. The true average number of words per verse in the entire King James Bible, if you actually take the time to count it exactly, is about 25.4. 
So, in other words, from sampling, I, I, you know, I, I can do numerical things well. Um, moreover, if we look at other translations, <coughs> uh, we find, for example, that the Revised Standard Version of the Bible consistently has about 95% as many words per verse as the King, as the King James Bible does. That is a quite robust statistic. Even though I only looked at a few of the verses, I can be I can be fairly sure that that's true in the in the entire thing. Curiously, two of the most readable translations of the Bible, the, the today's English version and the Living Bible, turn out to have only 85% as many words um, as the King James when you look at the Old Testament part. But in the New Testament, 110% as many words in the New Testament. Now, these statistics, again, were quite robust in the sample, and so there's clearly indication of a distinctive editorial policy. Uh, in, uh, incidentally, a week and a half ago, there was a big convention here in Boston um, uh, where about seven or 8,000 theologians uh, came to town. And I went to one of the public sessions, and I learned about a new book called The, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible. Uh, a, a new translation of the Bible based on the, on the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And so naturally I, I, I took a look at the copy and looked up uh, uh, a few of the 316 verses that I, that, that I knew by heart. And, and I can vouch from that, that uh, experience I decided to buy it. And I, and I think it's probably a very good book to, to have. It. Okay. Now, um, uh, I'll, well, thinking about Boston at, the, at Thanksgiving time also, uh, we, we did some of the some of the history tour things, and uh, reminded me that shortly after the American Revolution, Thomas Paine wrote a pamphlet called The Age of Reason, uh, in which, uh, among other things, he violently attacked the Bible. N many of his, of his comments uh, can be seen today as valid criticisms of 18th century Bible interpretation, but in general, um, he went way overboard in his argument. For example, here's what one of the things that... Um, uh, that, that uh, Thomas Paine said in his pamphlet. <clears throat> Quote, when, when we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we call it the word of a demon than the word of God. So, end of quote from Thomas Paine. Well, um, you know, my sample of 316 verses shows that in this respect, at least, uh, he was dead wrong. You have to work hard to imagine that even 5% of those verses have anything to do with what he claimed occupies more than half of the Bible. Um, now, I, I did some more calculations, too, and I have to report that these actually, however, did cast some doubt on the validity of my sampling method. So i got to show you this quickly. The numbers aren't re really important, but... Um, but I found out that uh, after I finished the project that uh, a new edition of Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible was published, and, it, and at the end of, the, of that book was a list of 1,861 verses that were really called key verses, which were selected by Bible scholars from different, uh, different groups, uh, saying that these are somehow the, the most important verses in the Bible in their opinion, for one reason or another. And... Um, and so uh, 1,800 verses out of the total number of 31,000 verses. Um, and so I naturally wanted to see how many of those had been in my sample. It turned out that, that, that 10 of, their, uh, of these uh, you know, uh, key verses uh, uh, were, uh, had been hit in, the 316, in my 316 sample. Uh, and I thought, wait a minute, this, is, this, isn't, uh, this, is, this is very un improbable. Uh, in fact, I worked out the prob some probabilities here. So, so then it, 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 it occurred to me that, that uh, probably I was fooling myself a little bit. When I, the reason that I started this project, uh, although I was thinking that uh, chapter 3, verse 16 was, uh, was uh, a, you know, a completely, uh, completely random verse, except in the, book, in the Gospel of John, uh, in fact, um, uh, 
uh, that that's, that's not consistent with this uh, with this with the statistics that it, that uh, it would have hit ten out of the out of these other key verses. So probably what ha what happened was that subconsciously I had been noticing in previous years uh, that this number three sixteen caught in my mind, you know, and I would see a I would see a reference to Colossians three sixteen. I say hmm three sixteen that's that's kind of interesting, you know. And so somehow maybe in the back of my mind when I started the project. I knew that the sample was a little bit salted, a little bit enriched from from from, from completely normal. So what would happen if, if for example, that I, I knew um, of, of these 59 verses, if I knew uh, that uh, um, a certain number of, of them in advance were good, I call that I call that G, and then I say, what's the probability that I would that I, that I would pick that I would hit 10 or more of the of the good ones in um, uh, in the sample, and it turned out that, you know it's only less than one percent chance uh, uh, if if I only knew John 3:16. But if I knew two of the good verses, I would have gotten still only about two percent of a chance of, of of hitting so many good ones. Um, and so uh, uh, the best I can conclude is that I probably knew uh, four or five of, of these verses uh, somehow from my previous reading, although although I wasn't you know I wasn't uh, uh, in, in my thinking, I probably had, had planted the idea somehow. Um, now, there's a little bit of a bias because uh, uh, good verses tend to occur more often in chapter three than in chapter, you know, in chapter 45 or something like that. Of, of, um, and so I, I, I checked that out too, and I looked at these 1,800 verses, and I said, said, how many of these, for example, are in the first half of the book? Um, where they appear, and, and there was a little bias to that. Like the, there were 54% of the of the verses that were selected as being as being good uh, uh, were in the first part of the were in the early part of the of, of those parts of the Bible. Um, that's either because people who read it uh, get tired after they get to the second half, or else uh, or else the people who are writing it uh, want to put their good ammunition up in front. But anyway, uh, uh, there is a slight you know so so probably uh, you know it. it but, he, but even so, suppose I knew five of the verses were were, uh, uh, were going to were going to be hits. Uh, still, 54 out of 59 were completely unknown, and and uh, the fact that those other 54 turn out to be so uh, so interesting, I think, still uh, uh, st still makes the thing pretty much the same. Anyway, I had, I had to mention that. Uh, uh, but uh, I. Um, uh, I also, I guess, I have to apologize for being so numerical here because uh, uh, it's quite obvious that quantitative questions are inherently quite limited. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm a numerical kind of guy, so I had to talk about it. But the, the most interesting thing is that I learned uh, so many qualitative things from this study, from this sample. For example, uh, looking at hundreds of commentaries and maybe a dozen or more commentaries about each book of the Bible. And this 316 sampling method made it pretty easy to calibrate the commentaries, to, you know, to find out um, special talents and the biases of each author and to what extent they had done their homework in various respects. Um, early on, um, I started to notice, for example, I was consistently getting interesting material from a 23-volume commentary that was published in England about 100 years ago called the, the Pulpit Commentary. Uh, I found this in the Boston Public Library, and in this series, there would usually be four authors uh, writing independently about each group of verses in the Bible. Uh, some of the authors in this uh, pulpit commentary, they would bring up really good points, um, and other, uh, others were what uh, we might today call flamers. Uh, 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 you know, these these are people who could sit sit at their desk and just fill up pages with hot air about just about any topic whatsoever. Um, but even so, the neat thing was, from my point of view, is that even that all these people uh, were good British writers, and so even the Flamers had a wonderful vocabulary, and uh, you know, words that I had kind of forgotten because I had no occasion to use them in my computer books. So as I'm reading the pulpit commentary, I say to myself. Hey, I've got to find a way to use these great words. Um, now, of course, um, there tends to be a runt in every litter, and some of the commentaries I read were were big disappointments to me. I, uh, in some cases, uh, the authors did a superficial job. They didn't look closely into material as a good scholar would. Um, they ignored the challenging questions that other commentators wrestle with. Uh, in other words, they were writing for another audience, not for me. 
Um, in other cases, um, the comments would seem to me very lifeless and dry. They, they, they reeked of academic gamesmanship. Uh, being a college professor myself, I, I think it's fairly easy to smell such pretensions from a long way off. Of course, I have to sympathize with people who work in academic departments of theology because they have to deal with much harder questions than I ever have to consider and because it's enormously more difficult to do innovative work in a field that's been in existence for thousands of years. I, I suppose the best way to get tenure as a theologian is to say the wildest new things while not disagreeing too strongly with the people at your institution who got tenure just before you did. Um, in any academic field, people's egos are bound to intrude on the work they do, especially when their livelihood is at stake. Fortunately, enough people are left who really love what they do and who aren't just acting out some supposed strategy for success. I did run across a number of commentaries that I thought were not only good, excellent, but truly great. They combined superb scholarship with a genuine love for the subject that came through in the writing. For example, one of the authors who became a personal hero for me in this regard was Raymond Brown, a Jesuit scholar formerly at Union Seminary in New York. After I finished the 316 book, I learned that he had retired to a small seminary in Menlo Park, California, near my home, and I had the opportunity to meet him in, in person and to present him with a copy of the, of the completed book. Uh, to my delight, he actually read it and claimed to like it. I, uh, <laughs> I was very sad to learn of his death a few months ago, especially because I didn't hear about it in time to attend the funeral service. <clears throat> One advantage of a project like this in which I was reading things written about the same topic but written over a period of many hundreds of years is that it gave me a feeling for the dynamic nature of bi biblical interpretation. As people's understanding of the world changed, so did their understanding of the Bible. Each generation of scholars would correct the misapprehensions of the previous generations. Sometimes they would come up with brand new ideas. Sometimes they would realize that ideas that had been rejected in the previous generation weren't so foolish after all, and so on. Uh, nobody seemed to uh, point out that their own ideas would probably be largely discredited by future generations. Um, as I was writing this book, 316, I knew uh, that it would be pointless to be politically correct with respect to the scholarship of the 1980s, um, and I, uh, so I tried to anticipate the swings of the pendulum that would occur uh, and to imagine what would be perhaps a future consensus about the various issues that, that came up. Uh, now, of course, I knew that this meant half of my book would seem hopelessly out of date to today's biblical scholars, but maybe in a few years the other half might be out of date. Um, and, 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 and you know, the old part would come back again uh, like, uh, like styles always do. Anyway, I did my best to select from what I read uh, the, uh, the points and the ideas that seemed to me that they would have the most longevity. One question I asked myself was, that, uh, in view of all, these, uh, all this uh, continually changing trends, uh, uh, is God ha happy with the ways the Bible has been interpreted and misinterpreted over the years? And my study of the 316s actually led me to, a to answer this question with a resounding yes. One of the messages that came through loudest and clearest is that God definitely wants people to be actively searching for better understanding of life's mysteries, even though these mysteries will never be fully understood. For example, Revelation 316, the, the last one, um, uh, says that God prefers an atheist to a person who's apathetic about religion. Um, I learned that from God's point of view, um, as explained, uh, uh, as expressed in these verses I read anyway, uh, uh, the, um, the policy of continually asking uh, and trying to answer the difficult and unanswerable questions is far better than to ignore those questions. It's something, it's something like a software company um, that, that wants uh, continuous feedback from its users so that better manuals can be written. Um, Peter Gomes, who's been the uh, Harvard's preacher for 25 years, uh, said it this way. <clears throat> All our scholarship and research, our linguistic and philological skills, 
The tools of every form of criticism available to us are merely means by which the living spirit of the text is taken from one context and appropriated totally into our own. The history of interpretation bears witness to this in every age. Our understanding of what the Bible says and means evolves. The Buddhists say, seek not to follow in the footsteps of the men of old, rather seek what they sought. To understand the dynamic aspect of scripture, we must appreciate the fact that what they sought seeks us. And in fact, what they sought is apprehendable to us in terms and times that we can best understand. Uh, end quote by, by Peter Gohm. Um, from the 316 Project, I learned that there are often no easy answers, and I also learned to be glad about that. Thank God there's no way to prove or disprove the existence of God. Uh, here's a similar uh, sentiment that Eugene Wigner, Princeton physicist, uh, said in 1981. He's speaking about physics instead of about religion. <clears throat> it is good that the completion of our scientific work is an unattainable ideal. Striving toward it is attracting many of us and gives much pleasure and satisfaction. If science were completed, the satisfaction which research, the furthering of human knowledge, had provided would disappear. Also, even more men would strive for power and domination. <clears throat> we know that there are facts and insights which we cannot communicate to animals. No animal is familiar, for instance, with the associative law of multiplication. <clears throat> that, I thought, was pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> Is it not possible that our understanding of nature also has limitations that couldn't be explained to us? I hope that even if this should be true, we will be able to continue the extension of our knowledge indefinitely, even if the limit thereof will always remain widely separated from the complete knowledge and understanding of nature. Eugene Wigner. I also ran across a quote from a sermon given by Harvard astronomer Owen Gingrich a few years ago in Washington's National Cathedral. I see he's... Uh, He's here today, so I hope I quote it right. Um, <clears throat> he said, um, The search for God is subtle, but perhaps it is this long journey, this search, more than anything else, that makes us human. We are the thinking part of this vast and sometimes very intimidating universe, and our quest could well be the purpose of it all. <clears throat> the most interesting thing, perhaps, that I learned from studying the 316s, which... Um, as I say, were mostly a random selection of verses, was that the balance of topics that, that you find in those verses is uh, rather different from the things that are most often preached about in churches or most often associated with the Christian religion. For example, lots of people associate religion with prohibitions, like don't have sex. Sure enough, three of the 316s have something to say about sex. Well, three out of 59. But one of them glorifies it. Another one brings out the important point that childbearing is painful. And the third one is about morality and holiness. Another one of the 316 warns that drunkenness has its downside. On the other hand, at least five of the 316s talk about worship. Five of them talk about God's spirit. Four about spiritual peace for about Bible study itself. The curious thing is that only two of these verses deal with the supposedly central doctrines of salvation about heaven. And one of these, John 3.16, was the one I started with without, without, without the randomization process. Now, I certainly don't want to belittle the notion of Jesus Christ as a Savior, and I'm sure that the promise of heaven was very important to me when I was growing up. But I remember being happy to realize maybe 20 years ago that heaven was no longer a big deal for me. I'm, I'm extremely glad that God has something in mind for the future, whatever it is. But the prospect of heaven has basically nothing to do with why I go to church every Sunday now. The important thing to me, like Wigner and Gingerick said in different words, is not the destination, but the journey. Philippians 3.16 says it well. Meanwhile, let us keep in step with the pace we have set. This concept 
is the main point of the biblical book of Ecclesiastes. And I keep seeing it again and again being rediscovered by people who notice how different it is from the bottom line mentality of the present era. I think about it often as I, as I bike um, along the Charles River th these days, every morning at sunset, sunrise on my way to MIT, every afternoon at sunset as I'm returning home, how great to be alive and going somewhere. Now, I could take the tea and get, there, get home a lot faster, but uh, I wouldn't see the beautiful uh, Charles River and all the other things. It just, it just uh, makes life worthwhile. In a similar vein, I realized many years ago the real purpose of playing golf is not to get the ball in the hole. It's, it's to have a good excuse to be outdoors in a beautiful place. And, and the same goes for other sports. At this time of year, a month before Christmas, the main theme of sermons in Christian churches is waiting. Waiting for God. Uh, this concept is not what computer scientists call busy waiting, in, in which we're just spinning our wheels, nor is it going to sleep until receiving a wake-up call, some kind of an interrupt signal. It's an active waiting that I plan to say a little more about next week. I recently ran across a 150-year-old quotation by Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Harvard professor of medicine whose son was a famous uh, Supreme Court justice. Here's what he said. <clears throat> I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. To reach the port of heaven, we must sail sometimes with the wind and sometimes against it. But we must sail and not drift nor lie at anchor. Now, in a way, uh, Holmes didn't quite get it because he talked about reaching the port of heaven. Um, but uh, people can probably only understand the worth of doing something if it has a purpose. Uh, my present uh, attitude is that the purpose of having a purpose is so that we can have a fulfilling journey. Uh, Holmes went on a few pages later uh, to compare the process of living to various phases in a, uh, in a horse race. And he says, the, and the final winning post uh, is a slab of white or gray stone where there is no more jockeying or straining for victory. And he said, the final places in the race actually matter very little if the horses have run as well as they know how. So I hope you understand this point about the journey more important than the destination. Ever since I started to work on tech about 20 years ago, people have been accusing me of being afraid to finish volume four of the art of computer programming. <laughs> they, they don't want me to be always in a state of writing it. Well, I, I have to report that my main purpose in studying the 316s was to get insight into what God wants me to do. The most repeated theme in all those verses is that people are encouraged to do their best to be in harmony with God's wishes. And I'm happy to report that I do think God wants me to finish Volume 4. <laughs> now, now, that book won't be the, supreme, the crowning achievement of God's creation but I'm certainly trying to make it a step in the right direction. Meanwhile, I also do continue part-time to explore the mysteries of God, even while knowing that I won't ever get to the bottom of them. <clears throat> I put Raymond Smullyan's short story, Planet Without Laughter, on the web because I think it's a great thought-provoking parable that can be understood on many different levels. I'm hoping that it might help a few of you uh, to... Um, understand uh, uh, some, some things as it helped me to understand some of the mysteries about the concept of faith and about the limits of rationality. One of the th things the 316 Project did for me was to prepare me to really appreciate um, writings of Paul Tillich, who I have just begun to read since coming to MIT, thanks to Anna First. Uh, in one of Tillich's sermons from the 1940s, he gave an excellent description of the way I sometimes feel deep down. Um, he spoke of a victory not attained by ourselves, but present beyond expectation and struggle. Suddenly, <clears throat> we are grasped by a peace which is above reason, that is above our theoretical seeking for the true, and above our practical striving for the good. We know that now, in this moment, we are in the good, in spite of all our weakness and evil. 
just like the people in Smolian's story who tried unsuccessfully to, um, to acquire a sense of humor by practicing how to laugh, Tillich spoke in another sermon about how a new thing mysteriously happens inside of us. <clears throat> he said, we cannot force it, we cannot calculate it. But the people in Planet Without Laughter, in, uh, they did eventually get it. And so I think the bottom line is, seek and you shall find, and keep seeking. Thanks for, for today. Now I'm ready for questions. In fact, I'm, I guess we got plenty of time for questions. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. When you were talking about the uh, various theologians who uh, pick their favorite passages and how it seemed that the correlation with the 316 verses was uh, out of whack, and you were trying to figure out why that was, is it also possible that the choices that the theologians made possibly were also influenced by that magic number 316? And maybe they had some of the same. Okay, so the question is, is it possible that that, the, that this, those theologians were influenced by the magic number 316? No, I, I, I say no. Um, I, 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 I looked at the verses uh, and, uh, I can't, and I can't see that. In fact, some of the verses are, you know, verse 4, 3 and things like that. Uh, I mean, you know, there's nothing magical about it. No, I, I'm sure that if I had done seven seven, I would have come up with with uh, uh, with, with the similar impressions. Um, now, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, to, so a, a, absolutely, uh, I, I absolutely reject this idea that there's something mystical about those numbers. Um, although I did find a, pa- a pattern about three sixteen in, in a. Uh, uh, well, well, two of them actually. I see Arvin sitting next to you there. As we were driving, as we were driving to his house a couple of weeks ago, we we passed the intersection and look at the left. It's Routes three and sixteen. Um, you know, going to Arlington. Um, uh, in, and uh, and I, I put a puzzle on on the, on the door of my office uh, that I found in Sam Lloyd puzzle book from 100 years ago. Where there's, it's called the dunce puzzle, where there's three, three boys that have a three, one, and six, and, and it says three sixteen right in there. And, you know, that, I see this all the time, finding more patterns, but I can't believe that it has any anything, <laughs> any, any relevance whatsoever. No, in fact, uh, uh, though, though the the um, uh, you know the the, the, the famous. Uh, the, the famous verses are, are, you know, many of them are in the Old Testament, um, but the, no, the most famous one is probably like Second Timothy 3:16 uh, about inspiration of, of scripture by inspiration of God. First Timothy 3:16, the poem that I talked about a few, few weeks ago, um, and um, uh, and I, 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 those verses are so often referred to that it's probably, you know, Colossians 3.16 is, uh, is, is one that musicians love about, uh, about worshiping uh, uh, with joy and things. Uh, so it's quite possible that those would have, have, uh, have, have jumped out somehow in, into my head. <laughs> yeah. Pushing in the opposite direction, it seemed like those 1861 verses might be clustered somewhat by books. Well, well they're, they're, they actually include all, all books of the Bible, but of course uh, um, there's, there's clusters like the Ten Commandments, each one gets in there. Uh, you know, and, and, and they, they, you know. Um, um, yeah, so, so um, anyway, uh, don't, wor- don't worry about, about saving my sample. I still have 54. Oh, uh, random, <laughs> random points. Yeah. Uh, David? Um, what made you feel that God wants you to complete volume four? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's similar to what, uh, what, what Guy Steele said uh, the other day. Uh, somehow, you know, why did he make me good at it? Uh, um, if that wasn't, you know, a way to glorify some, somehow. Uh, I mean, we're, if you were writing, uh, you know, if, if if you were programming a robot, wouldn't you love for to have it come up with volume four, you know, uh, or something like that, you know? So, so, um, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, in, you know, but I, but I also, uh, uh, 
say that because I, uh, uh, you, know, I you know, I'm not going to ever um, be giving lectures like this again either. I mean, you know, <laughs> this is what I do well is write books. Okay. Yes. Is there by any chance any correlation? with <clears throat> verses that wound up having very controversial and opposing interpretations. One of those 316, for example, all scriptures inspired by God and so forth, I suspect you as a fellow Lutheran are very aware how the conservative Lutherans used to beat the head of the moderate Lutherans with that. See, you guys don't accept all of the truth in the Bible, and we do, and this is the verse that tells you you have to. This is a battleground in all denominations, this particular yes. verse, and, and it was also, I noticed... Uh, uh, as after I started the 316 project, I noticed that the Second Timothy 316 is is cited by by its number on the book flap of the of Phillips's translation of the New Testament, um, and, and it grabbed me immediately at that point. So I'm sure, pretty sure that I I would have seen it at some previous time in my life. Um, yeah. So 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 anyway, the one so but but the ones that are referred to. Uh, then would have would have a chance of of coming somehow into my head, yeah, um, and and uh, and uh, uh, where things are are, are controversial or, or I I don't um, I'm not sure. Well, there's uh, it's so uh, it's so um, uh, dangerous to try to prove something from from one single verse, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so. Um, uh, I, 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 I was glad to, to be able to actually write about that verse, and, uh, and I found many other people uh, uh, giving helpful comments about that, uh, about that particular verse, which, which, uh, which said, look, the point of the verse is, is really how, how useful uh, the scripture is, um, and, and, and uh, it's not, the, Paul wasn't saying in this, in this verse particularly, uh, uh, arguing about this, about this, this point, uh, and what did he mean by scripture at, at his time, uh, uh, anyway, because the, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So, um, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, so, so there's a lot, go, but, but anyway, uh, uh, the, the sample, the, 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 the idea of the, of the, uh, of the random sampling means that I'm looking mostly at, at except for these these uh, um, extreme these these unusual points, uh, I'm us looking mostly at at at, at the Bible in, in a in a way that is is not biased by somebody saying look at this particular one, and and that's where it struck me what the what the balance was, and 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 uh, uh, I have to say that. Uh, it, it worked too well. Um, that is, um, uh, the fact that I had looked at these verses so so uh, thoroughly gave me more confidence than I should have had. Um, it made it gave me this hubris, you know, that that I because I I had to remember that I only studied you know 60 out of 31,000, uh, uh, but it made me feel like I knew. Many, more, you know, much more than I actually did. Just the fact because I had uh, had done something firmly, um, uh, and I can't, uh, I, I, you know. So, so, so don't take don't take what I say as being absolutely definitive. But I, I, I think that it was significant that the that the, the sense of balance that I got uh, was strongly toward this idea of uh, uh, be in tune with be in tune with what God. Uh, uh, once and uh, and and keep uh, and and, and uh, keep searching. That was that that kept coming all, all back and forth. I have to I have to go to the other. Yes. I use what? The phrase God's point of view. God's point of view. Yes. No, no. Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned the other day that that um, it's not it, it's not uh, that Second Timothy three sixteen by itself is an ambiguous 
is, is ambiguous. Uh, uh, in, in it, it, it could mean from the and people have have endlessly argued about it whether it, that, whether it means that all scripture is inspired by God or whether it means all scripture that happens to have been inspired by God is 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 referred to and um, uh, that's uh, and, and that's why I said it, it, it was a battleground between people who are looking for this idea of verbal inspiration, uh, the, the dictation, uh, as as uh, uh, at, instead of um, of saying that it was more more or less um, uh, uh, in, you know strongly influenced, but not to the point of uh, or to, to, to how how extent it was. Now um, the. Uh, uh, the, in my in, in the book 316, I try I I try to uh, uh, summarize what people from many different persuasions have said about these things, and I um, and I try to uh, waffle as far as taking my own stand on whether or not you know exactly which part I uh, which which way I come down on these on these tough questions because uh, uh, there is no. There's no thorough proof of these things, and I still think it's a, it's an important issue for everybody to to work out for themselves. Um, my my own uh, uh, my, my own feeling is that the that the uh, uh, that that the, the Bible was inspired in a way that that uh, that that I can't. Explained, but I don't think it was a verbal thing being dictated. My, that's not my uh, my attitude. I, I spoke at the panel discussion about when I was writing sur- surreal numbers, and I felt that it, there was some kind of a muse dictating a little bit to me. I had a little bit of an experience where where uh, where, where I felt uh, uh, that that uh, I was getting some kind of an ins- inspiration, but also I was involved with that and. and uh, it's co- quite clear from this study of the 316s that the, that um, uh, o- over thousands thousands of years, many many uh, m- m- many many things have happened to the text. Uh, p- people who are well-meaning have ha- have looked at it and said, "Well, he d- does it really mean that? I think I better improve it." You know, it's just the way people try to do with with tech. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, until I had to lay down the law. Uh, um, so, so, um, uh, so. In fact, the study of the Bible shows that we have to appreciate uh, the, its its long history. Um, one of the uh, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned briefly the other day about how Isaac Newton had 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 found where somebody had gratuitously uh, changed. First Timothy 3:16, in order to to make the doctrine of the Trinity a little clearer, um, and and uh, he found he he did a lot of research on original manuscripts and found out where this particular thing started and then had been copied after that and so on. So uh, there's another case where you study Romans 3:16 and you find out that part of the New Testament got into the Old Testament because of copyists. <laughs> Um, so, so you have to be careful about what exactly you mean by, with the Bible, and, and, and you know. And so, I, so although I believe the inspiration was, I personally believe the inspiration was there. I also believe that we have to look uh, uh, closely to to uh, uh, to interpret it. And um, and and uh, this, uh, uh, it might be that that God has also inspired, uh, uh, you know. Um, the, uh, the 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 canon of other religions. Yes. You said you did the 316 project as part of figuring out what God wanted you to do. Yes. What would you say to the average person who wanted to figure out what God wants him or her to do, but maybe doesn't have the resources to take such a big project? Yeah. Uh, what do I say to to people who who want to find out what God wants for them? I would say, uh, don't be apathetic about God. Try to search. Try to Try to keep asking questions, uh, um, and 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 uh, uh, don't be discouraged if you if you don't ever get the answer because because asking the questions is really a, uh, is really a good way to live. <laughs> yes. Do you think that the ambiguity in all these passages is just the fashion of the writing, 
Is it by design or is it introduced through translation and copy? Do I think in the ambiguity is by is by design or by or introduced by mistake or or or, or something? I you know I I really haven't haven't got a good clue. I tried in my translation to keep it ambiguous if it was, so that was by design. Um, but, um, uh, you, you know, I, I, when I give out exam questions in class, so my questions are often very ambiguous, and I didn't intend that at all. Uh, the students are, are very creative in finding other meanings for my, <laughs> for my thing. So, so that's, you know, I suspect that's what happened. Of uh, what the maybe, maybe you know, and, and in a way, you know, uh, it could have been, you know, that God wanted it to be ambiguous. <laughs> I mean, uh, because I, I mean, um, if I mean, suppose, suppose God, uh, uh, you know. Um, since Jesus at the time of videotape and, 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 and you know, and so we, we got these, you know, uh, this digital record of, 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 of Jesus. Uh, uh, then um, uh, what's there left for, uh, for people to do to, to, to uh, you know, to, um, uh, to, to take that into their own, uh, in, into their own being? Um, so in a way, I, I think uh, God uh, uh, probably uh, was very smart to uh, uh, to do all this before technology came along. Uh, uh, Arvin. I think I want to go a little bit for the scholarly concerns to more personal. I'm still not, I'm not giving you a clear picture of how this project affected you. Did it change your faith, your beliefs? Okay, so 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 Arvind says, how did it affect me personally? Did it change my faith, my beliefs, my spirituality? Um, I would say that it affected me in one way. As I said, it gave me more hubris about the, about the, my understanding of stuff, and I, you know, it, it it affected me in other ways. Where I would, you know, where I would um, be. Um, um, uh, well. Called upon to be a guru that in places where I wasn't uh, uh, really that that uh, uh, talented, but um, but uh, no, but actually no, it it, it made me uh, uh, understand the uh, the complexity of of uh, the, 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 that things aren't black and white. Uh, as I you know, and, and I became much less uh, much less. Um, um, Dogmatic about 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 these questions of religion, um, uh, and I, um, I I guess I I, I started to to uh, you, know, you know to see how the things that I had noticed in the Bible are also uh, I, I'm learning about other religions and I'm seeing that that God is not exclusively uh, communicating to the uh, to the Christians in the Bible, as far as I can see, that these are ways that now uh, it would have happened. No matter, you know, just because I made this study, it it, it gave me a it it, gave, it it I was putting a lot more of my of my cycles into this in, in you know in, into thoughts like that, um, and so naturally that would that would change it. And and if it hadn't been is interesting when I started. I mean, I started out just as a ho- you know a hobby to look at these things uh, 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 the way I had looked at other 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 questions, and uh, and uh, but then uh, I got got uh, hooked on it, and and I also could see from this that uh, that it was important. Um, yes. How did I become interested about God and religion in the first place? It was uh, because of the uh, family I was born into. If I were born in another another thing, I'd, my life would no doubt have been quite quite different. Uh, one of the things I did uh, find to my surprise, I had a, I had uh, 30, 40 people uh, uh, read the manuscript of my book before publication and, and gave me their comments, and often uh, I would get you know, 10-page single-space letters from them, um, um, and uh, uh, in in two or three cases, it surprised me how how angry these people were at God because of something that had happened in their family. 
you know, and uh, uh, this uh, this was a, a, a revelation to me. I hadn't known that the, the, the kind of bitter feelings that, that that other people had. It was just not part of, my, of of you know things that I had experienced in my growing up. And and I uh, uh, still they they were bothered by it enough that they're that they were you know r- really looking closely at my book and helping me h- helping me write it. Uh, but uh, the, I, I I realized that I was. Uh, uh, that, that that I was very fortunate to have had a uh, ha- have had an atmosphere where where I I didn't have to feel threatened by God or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, two questions. My first is kind of related to the last two. I was just wondering how you would characterize your relationship with God before the project. You touched on it. Yeah. The question is, well, you give me your second question too. But your first question was, uh, how, what was my relationship with God pre three sixteen? Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and the second question is, do you have any more of those shirts? <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the second question: Do I have any more of these shirts? So, so, uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, I got this shirt at at, at a Stanford Crafts Fair, uh, at, at, probably at Christmas time, and then my wife made this nice patch for it. But uh, that's is unique. Um, but uh, no, before before this, uh, I was um, I I was uh, uh, going to church on Sundays and. Uh, and uh, oblivious to to God, you know, the the, the rest of the week, um, or or in most of Sundays too. But uh, um, but uh, you know, I was I, I had I, I had uh, grown up in with uh, my my father was a uh, church organist, and uh, you know, so I have a you know, uh, and so I so I had this uh, you know a, a very strong. Uh, 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 with with family, you know, we'd always pray before meals, things like that. So so, I, but I was just a, I, but I I was uh, pretty much a, uh, uh, you know, like a like a machine as far as far as uh, most most other things of life outside of computer science was concerned. Not only in religion, but with respect to you know reading, reading great literature and things like that. In the back. of the first three volumes of the art of programming and the way you write so eager to prove everything, I would have swore that you were not a religious person. Because okay. in some sense, uh, it looked to me that mathematics and the, the love for precision was what drove your life. I mean, somehow. Do you think that the writing of chapter four after your four <laughs> after your three sixteen project will make my reading a bit have a different I, feeling of what God first and I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Did you hear Manuela's comment? She said, "Okay." So uh, she says, is, "Is Volume Four going to have have a spiritual thing in it?" So, um, you know, so uh, more, uh, ambiguity. more ambiguity. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, no, I, 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 I mean, this is compartmentalization. You know, like, like just like President Clinton, I, you know, I, 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 Yes. Um, it's actually sort of a similar thing, which is we talked. I mean, the sort of title is "Glimpses of God," and you kind of talk mostly about how you give it. You, you what about the search given that you want? You know, you want to understand God better. Is there aspects of um, sort of your study of your science, your study of your sixteens, um, the various things that made you sort of see God more, like sort of evidence? Yeah. How do I see it more in life? You know this. This this uh, this piece that I started out talking about this this four play uh, is the, the text is not a Christian text. It's based on Greek mythology um, about the story about Apollo and and yet yet it's it's uh, it's in um, it's in the uh, Swedish churches at Christmas time and uh, and I, I I looked it up on the web in order to find out who the you know who was the person who wrote the poem. 
and uh, and, and, there, and I found right away a web page saying, uh, you know, should we perform this in in a church because it was because it was uh, based on, uh, on 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 mythology, and the conclusion was yes, uh, uh, absolutely because uh, this God in disguise. Um, uh, is is something that uh, you know that that uh, shows how uh, how 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 God somehow is it seems to be present. Now, don't ask me to explain uh, the mathematics of how it happened or why it, why why it is, but uh, uh, and and or or to prove anything um, about it. But um, just like the people in this planet without laughter. Um, uh, seemed to know that um, what a joke was. Um, I seem to know somehow uh, w- when there's uh, when there's some uh, aspect of uh, of uh, uh, the divine uh, present. Now this might be my delusion, of course. Yes. <clears throat> Should I have started the 316 project sooner? Uh, well. It, it, uh, uh, you know, it, the timing. It, yeah, I I felt called to do it. I, you know, in a way, I, it, um, uh, and it wouldn't have worked if sooner because uh, I I was uh, part of the the whole driving thing was the beautiful artwork that went with it, and I didn't know I didn't know the type designers until I started working working on typography. So if I had done it sooner, um, uh, it would have. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have turned out anywhere near the same. So somehow the timing was very serendipitous. Yes. Uh, there is, I think we're talking about one thing that Guy Steele hinted to in the discussion that we had here. That one intellectual lever we have in computers and mathematics about dividing things like this is: Did you in your think? Do you in your thinking understand Gödel's theorem or not? Our early theologians didn't know Gödel's theorem. They didn't know that Heisenberg had certain differences, and they didn't know these these humility <laughs> Okay, now I I. Uh uh, I, I'm going to be talking about I'm going to be talking about this next week. Uh, although I have to say about Gödel's theorem, um, I I know the proof about Gödel's theorem, and I don't believe that it really is relevant to what you think it is. But Heisenberg's principle, I I, I I'm more in. in, in. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, what would you recommend for computer science students who never read the Bible? Would you recommend a random sampling technique? Or? Uh, <laughs> Well, a certain, you know, certainly read my book, you know, makes, makes, it, makes it, you know, makes it a wonderful Christmas present. So, um, I, uh, no, no, I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, th- think about it yourself. Don't, don't, you know, don't listen to anything that I, that I, that I said particularly. I tried to, I, I tried to explain what impressed me about all the things that I read, you know, and, and, and um, uh, the, uh, but um, but there is uh, but you know as in, as an introduction uh, I, I don't know I, I enjoy reading this book by Gomes the, called the Good Book which uh, which I just finished reading um, uh, he he he's uh, 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 you know you know knows uh, he talks to Harvard undergraduates for the last 25 years and so he knows what they need <laughs> and so uh, and, and and so I I can recommend that uh, yes. Well, one thing, with, you know, when I think about the scientific process in general is that, that scientists work in collaboration in the sense that, that there's a scientific community and one tests one's work against uh, what the community is up to. And theologians and people in the church certainly very much do the same thing. In fact, that's sort of part of the theology of it all. Uh, and it ties in with the question we just heard, I think. I, I guess is, is maybe if you could speak... I. I I'd make the proposition that if someone's asking the question of, uh, you know, trying to read the Bible from scratch for the first time, that it might be real helpful to become part of, make some connection with the community of other folks who are also attempting that exercise. And, and maybe you could tie in this project's work with the idea of... of that, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, community. <laughs> you don't have to do it on your own, in fact. Uh, in, in fact, uh, there there are... There, there are various groups that are people that are trying to help each other this way, and uh, and uh, the um, 
and and uh, that's what the people in Smolian's story did too. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, that, that's not. A, don't push that analogy too far. But uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, high hit rate of good verses you had in your random sampling makes me think that maybe over time, Bible authors may have deliberately do stuff the 316th verse in the book because it's yeah. like a like a marketing thing. I know people are going to this verse and going to make it really good, but it's biased by the authors. Yeah. Yeah, this, see, see, these the, that that's not tenable because the, the the verse numbers were added hundreds of years after the, the texts were written. Um, uh, and, but I did find a commentary by Adam Clark from 1830s where he where he commented to, to his surprise, First John 3:16 was was very was almost as good a verse as. Ordinary John 3:16, or first, yeah, and and uh, so uh, people have have been noticing. Other people have been noticing this, um, uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, but that is uh, um, as I say, it's only a very small part of the sample. I, I, I don't think it should be take. We should take much significance to that. Yes. The Hebrew Bible versus the New Testament. Can you make any general statements about the kinds of yeah, conclusions about the Hebrew Bible versus the New Testament. I'm not sure if how 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 well uh, uh, you know it 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 it's uh, it, there's one other bias in my sample when I compare the Hebrew versus the New Testament. That is, there's a lot more books written about the New Testament than about the Old Testament. Uh, so uh, so you have to hedge hedge by 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 saying that. But uh, I did find that. When I'm writing all of these chapters in the book, um, um, you know, in, in every, in just about every case, I think every case I had to cut. I, I mean, I had I wrote more material than would fit on two pages, and then I, you know, then I, you know, I had discretionary sentences to put in, and uh, uh, and, and and then I would take out the the least important parts until I finally fit it into two pages. And uh, with the New Testament, it was a lot harder. There was a lot. More, it seemed there was a lot more richness to there. It might be that the verses are longer. It might be that there's much more in the commentaries to it. But, but I did, I did, um, I, I did get a strong impression that that uh, there was uh, that that there was there there was a, a, a more of a density there, and that in the Hebrew Bible it would it would cover the same thing, but in a you know in a different pace. Yeah. Yes. What would be my guess about the percentage of my computer colleagues who have a faith in God? Um, yeah, that's a good question. But uh, I, my imp- so, so from personal discussions, I you know I would I, I would guess um, five to ten percent. But from but but from um, like some people. When ma- I remember one math professor at Caltech coming to me and said he didn't have a faith, but he was he was uh, uh, concerned about his children and and what would I recommend for them or something like that. You know, so, yeah. So does that count? You know, um, but um, uh, it um, it's very easy for people in sciences to um, uh, uh, to. Uh, to, to believe that once you've learned something, then you don't need much help for anything else. I don't know. And, and I, I haven't really understood this very, uh, this this point of view. It seems to me that the more I discover in science, the the more I know, realize I don't know. But um, but uh, uh, I I, uh, I I guess that after I went to the to the big leagues, to the to the world class universities, I, I I came to the fewer and fewer people who would who would have this faith, and and as I said the first lecture, I was mostly disappointed by the fact that all they knew about faith was what they heard on the radio from the uh, um, from the people that were pretty wild, uh, uh, you know you know the people that are that are that are foretelling uh, the future uh, uh, based on the book of Daniel or something. Yes? Um, as opposed to the 10 uh, of the 59 that were, quote, good, uh, what about the uh, other end uh, where there are some 
Oh, oh, yeah, where they're doves. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, as I said, I, 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 I had to cut in each case. I, I could preach a sermon about any of the 59, and I think it would be uplifting. Uh, and, and in some cases, too long. <laughs> um, but but even the even the one that was about genealogy turned out to be very interesting genealogy. Uh, uh, that was just my 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 gut feeling. I I had to stretch a couple of them a little bit to to, to look in the context. Uh, but isn't uh, that even more unusual than the statistics of the ten? That's groups? yes. That's the point. The point is that that uh, the richness that was there. Uh, uh, was 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 definitely unexpected. And without that, I wouldn't have written the book, and then and then nobody would have known either. I mean, in other words, uh, there's there's a little bit of a bias in the fact that I that I found something. Uh, uh, you know, you, 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 if you don't say if you if you don't report something, then it doesn't get into the into the database. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's right. That's right. I I haven't got a, a, a control experiment where I can even take you know Shakespeare or Chaucer or whatever to the same degree. Uh, and you know I, I I can't do the Quran the same way. I um, I don't have the that much literature to to do the same kind of experiment with. Um, but I believe that any complicated subject, you get more insight by taking some kind of a random, random probe into it. And in, in this case, uh, uh, it's not just the commentaries that was that that uh, that, that it, the commentaries helped me understand the the, the, the depth there. But uh, uh, but really, um, uh, it was it was not it was more the, the the methodology. That is, I didn't just look at the verse and say ah. And close everything else off. But I, but but uh, but I I used the the other places where the same things had had occurred. You know, I looked at the vocabulary and, and so on. And I would do that with any book that I was studying in this way. It was much easier with the Bible because of these other reference materials that have, have occurred. Yeah. So do you believe there's structure in these verses that perhaps the original authors had no concept of that, that they would be surprised to have this interpretation and that. Some sense, is that, is that false because of that, or is that just a Well, um, there's, there, there are many cases where the original, where, where uh, people saw extra meaning in something uh, hundreds of years after the original was, was, was written. Um, and, and things were originally written for one audience and turned out to be inspiring for another. Uh, uh, now, you carry this to... If you carry this to an extreme, you get to this idea of postmodern uh, uh, interpretations of literature, which is tearing up so many humanities departments now. I mean, you know, the, to study, you, 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 you study. The, I, I know the, the Stanford's German department was was up in arms between two two wings of the department, and one in one wing they'd say, in order to in order to know about Goethe's work, you should uh, understand Goethe's life. Where, you know where he lived, or what the vocabulary he used at his time. The other half says, "Who uh, couldn't care less about Goethe? I, 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 I love this poem. Um, here's what it means to me, and I've got some neat things to say." You know, and, and so I just I, I forget about the history of it. Um, and um, and certainly some things are so rich that they can inspire people uh, uh, in a completely different way in another generation. But that's but uh, I don't. You know, uh, uh, I, I don't go along with that kind of thing, uh, except uh, there, there is some point where you might say that, in fact, um, uh, there's no reason why that all the inspiration had to had to be for the writer. So, so uh, uh, take the uh, um, the the uh, all the Hebrew scriptures, for example, the the rabbis who commented on them over the years, and the, you know the Talmud. Writings that you more and more writing about the about about things. Uh, these other people are adding uh, adding important things to the uh, uh, to the to the text. 
I'm glad you're asking such tough questions. I, I, okay, Vera. I think one more question. Oh, we have time for one more. Question. Yeah, one more. Do I do I think what? A taboo in our culture. <coughs> okay, say your question again. You want to recite the verses? Okay, so I I, I, I did. So. Um, I, a taboo in the society about seeing glimpses of God. I, I suppose uh, we, the, we, we have a. Uh, uh, we don't since we don't have any models about it, and we're, and we're so much model based in, uh, now. Um, and we can also we also know all the dangers about people who, who, uh, uh, you know, think that God wants them to kill somebody else or whatever, you know. And so we, so there's a, there's a natural uh, uh, kind of a you know hesitancy to, to all of this. And uh, what I'm talking about is something that uh, you know somehow um, uh, I, I can't be sure, but in some ways I am sure. I don't. Know, I tried to explain the feeling the way the way Tillich, uh, uh, the way Tillich put it. Now, um, um, as far as reading these verses is concerned, I. I can read for you Re- Revelation 3:16 and says surely I mean sorry since you are merely lukewarm neither cold nor hot I'm going to spit you out of my mouth um, here's um, uh, one that says uh, we know that true religion is a great mystery Christ was revealed in body justified in spirit witnessed by angels proclaimed by pagans trusted on earth Glorified in heaven. And I'll end with this one. It says, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in all ways. Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs>